without further ado, I do want to continue, but Rotem is, is waiting eager to start his lecture. Uh, I do want to introduce uh, Rotem, Rotem Rice, who is the director of uh, product security at uh, Playtica. Um, he also uh, uh, was or, or, or still now experienced full stack developer. However, he shift the site to security. So he knows all about the developers and now is a is a breaker. Let's call it breaking the code, not building it. Rotem, is that correct? Yeah, I agree to that. Yeah, I'll <laughs> take that. Uh, okay, but he's also continuous hardening and uh, doing security audits in his company, and also application hardening and system administration. Um, so, uh, guys, uh, stay tuned and 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 hear what uh, Rotem has to say related to risk-oriented in, in the DevSecOps. So, Autumn, you have the control. Okay, cool. Thanks, Leo. So, I must say before I even start about the last question that uh, Dennis, I think, asked. So, there was a big problem with his question, in my opinion, because he said, imagine you did everything perfect. So, security can never be perfect, and security is a feeling eventually, so we need to bear that in mind always. So, I had to say that, and now I can actually start. So first of all, hello everyone. I'm super happy to be here and speak about our approach at Platica for risk-oriented DevSecOps. Um, I see some people from Platica here in the webinar and the meetup, so hey. Um, okay, so you will find some similarities actually to what Bar uh, talked about. Uh, you will find a lot of similarities, but I think that we are both attacking it from two different angles. So I think that it will be interesting to, to see now my view on that. Um, so let's start. See that it works. Okay, cool. So I'm leading the product security activities at Platica. Um, I'm also, as Leo mentioned, uh, shifted from software development and DevOps to application security a few years ago. I'm also a contributor to multiple open source uh, projects and also a bug hunter on my spare time. So as I said, I like to break things. Uh, I think that this is like an integral part of the work of protecting something. You need to know how to break it. Um, I'm also responsible for multiple CVs and also helped securing some well-known companies like Microsoft, Tiao, uh, products like Elasticsearch. And last, I co-organized the first Israeli bug bounty community meetup together with a colleague of mine. So that's mostly about myself. So let's start. So we want to spice up our cyber eventually companies want to establish an application security program. And that was one of the questions here in the chat. So how do you even start? And I think that talking about DevSecOps, um, in order to talk about DevSecOps, you need to understand, first of all, what DevSecOps is. And Bar, as I said, presented his approach or what he think about DevSecOps. And I totally agree. Eventually, this is the triangle between development operations and security. And you need to have good vibe, let's say, or good communication with both sides uh, to, to, in order to actually do something uh, productive, I think. So let's see how we can start. Um, like every good presentation, I could show you some quotes about how outnumbered we are as application security people. But eventually, let me skip all that because we all know that. This is why we are here, to get some tips. But there is one quote that I'm not going to skip, and this is talking about fun. So eventually, in order to establish a good AppSec program, you need to have fun during the process mm -hmm. and all along the way. If you're not having fun or someone that is involved in a process like R&D teams, DevOps teams, so you need to stop and understand how you need to change stuff in order to people to have fun or at least try to have fun and not to suffer during the process. So that's highly important. Eventually, we want to make good communication with the other teams. Otherwise, it will be security and not the SecOps. So bear that in mind. So now if we will look 
at how an AppSec program looks like, and this is only a practical of what we actually have in this uh, enormous uh, iceberg. So we can take uh, a look at things like uh, WAF and API security, SCA, secure code data trainings, SAS, TIAS, DAST, all the things that uh, Bar also talked about. And in the top of the iceberg, we can take a look at penetration tests and external attack surface management, bug bounty program, things like that. So how do we start? And I must say that it's not that helpful that vendors be like, pick me, I have the best security tool that will make your company more secure. So it's not helpful, stop doing it. How do we start? So I believe that we need to make an informed decision making and no one knows your company better than you. But you need to ask yourself a few questions that will help you to get the right questions. And I gathered a few questions that you can ask and that will help you to understand where you need to start and where you need to focus. So first of all, how many applications you have in the company? So this is completely different if you are trying to protect a company with one product or if you are trying to protect a company with 15 products or hundreds of products. Eventually, you need to work with different technologies, different, different frameworks, and that's much harder. How many developers in the company? On some companies, you might have 20 developers and you're sitting next to them. And on other companies, you are working with uh, developers all around the globe in different time zones. And in the case of developers next to you, you can just go near them and do some uh, um, live code reviews and things like that and the uh, training sessions. So that's again, different between company to company. How does the CI CD look like? On some companies, you will have one single pipeline where you can put all your security tools inside and that's easy. But on other companies, you might have a lot of CI CD pipelines. You will also have some case of legacy software that you don't even have a CI CD uh, pipelines. So again, that's all different story. What are the crown jewels? And I think that this goes end by end with compliance requirements. So if I need to comply with GDPR, SOC 2, or even PCI, then it's a whole different story than not complying with all those. And by the way, there was another question about what do you do about a security breach? So eventually that highly depends on which uh, um, compliance uh, um, requirements do you have in your company. And then you understand what do you need to protect? Do I need to protect the data? Um, or, I don't know, uh, uh, transactions of uh, um, payment transactions, things like that. Who do we report to? This is also something important. Do I report to the CTO, to a VP R&D, to maybe IT? If I'm reporting to the IT, then it will be much harder for me to have any leverage on R&D teams and tell them how they need to work. But as opposed to the case where I'm reporting to the same VP R&D like them, and then I just go sit by them and he backs me up. Okay, so... Again, it's also important. And last, what are our weak spots? So I need to understand what are the main risks that I need to tackle and that will also allow me to focus better on where to start. So I'm going to share the happy path, at least how it was for us at Platica, and I think that it was happy eventually. Um, so I say, forget all the buzzwords and especially shift left. Um, shift left is good but it's not always the answer or it's not always the, the, the first thing to do. So it's cool to take static analysis tools and dynamic analysis and put all those in this uh, CI CD, but eventually it will take a lot of time, a lot of effort. It will have a lot of noise, uh, a lot of frictions with different teams, and it not might be the first thing to start with. So I'm saying boom, but your way to a scalable AppSec program, that's an acronym for where are we, outline your assets, mitigate low ending fruits, build a responsible disclosure process, assess and protect weak spots and track your security tickets in one place. And I know that it was fast. We are going to go over each and every one of the bullets and then you will understand what I'm actually saying. So I'm gonna show you how it's done. So first of all, where are we? What do I mean by that? So as I said, on my spare time and also most of my team on their spare time are also active bug hunters. So that means that we also know how to break stuff. 
you can't actually protect something without looking at it like an attacker. So this is why I think that starting from static analysis isn't always the first thing that I would do uh, when establishing an AppSec program, because I would wear my hoodie and I would try to attack the company, my company in this case, and try to understand what are the weak spots that I need to cover, what are my findings, and on a lot of cases, it will indicate where do I need to focus at at the beginning. Next is to outline our assets. So in this case, um, we will need to have some mapping of what we have externally exposed. So also internally, okay, so things like an internal back office systems are also important, but for start at least, we will start from the outside to understand what is exposed and what is putting us at risk. So in order to do so, I'm going to present a few and not only this specific uh, uh, thing about thing about the outline your assets, but about all the things that I mentioned, all the Wombat thing. Uh, I'm going to share a few open source tools. Some of those we developed, some of those are publicly developed by other people and other companies, uh, and you can start using them even today. So that's important. Um, and if you have any question about any of those, feel free to reach out afterwards. Some of those are in our uh, Platycan GitHub account. As you can see, you have it in the title. So let me just proceed. And if you can't find it, let me know afterwards. So the first tool is called the collector. What it does is fetch names from various sources like Amazon AWS, uh, uh, Route 53. A, a GCP, DigitalOcean, and Prisma Cloud by Palo Alto. Eventually, it goes to the cloud providers, it fetches all the DNS records from there, it creates a unified structure of all the DNS records that we have, and then we are good to go because we have a good list of all the assets that we have at the company. By the way, on the right side, you will see which phase am I talking about, and in this case, case I'm talking about the recon phase, the reconnaissance, but I'm also going to talk about the scan and remediation phases. So after we have the domain list, now we want to gather some URLs because eventually most of the bugs or the vulnerabilities won't actually be in the root domain itself. So how do we do that? We are doing it in two different uh, um, ways. One is use an open source tool called GAO. GAO is acronym for Get All URLs. This is a great open source tool that actually gets URLs from places like Alien Vault and the Web Archive, things like that. And the second way is to fuzz URLs from common word lists, like any of us that did some penetration testing in the past knows. So this is how we actually cover some URLs and we are good to go. The next thing, once we have all the URLs, is that we want to actually start mitigating so some low ending fruits. Why do we want to do that? Because again, we want to look at our organization like an attacker. Eventually what they will do and most of the script kid is do. And also a lot of hackers are on most cases lazy. And I think that on most cases they are not actually targeting your organization specifically, but they are just spraying their payloads until they will find a victim uh, they will put some ransomware on their systems or um, a crypto miner, things like that. So eventually we want to mitigate all the low input fruits um, and scan it just like any attacker will do. So how will we do that? So we have an internal tool this, guy, this time that is called Enant. Enant is actually just a wrapper for the open source tool called Nuclei. If someone here doesn't know Nuclei, this is an open source vulnerability scanner by a company called Project Discovery. This is a great tool. What it does is to have a lot of templates uh, based or written in YAMLs. And eventually what it does uh, is to scan for vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, CVEs, all those. Um, we are using it and running it with multiple periodical scans. We actually have scans uh, that run every few minutes. We also have another scan runs daily and another one which is run weekly. So we have a lot of different periodical scans, depends on the severity of the findings that we are looking um, and the commonness of the vulnerabilities that we are actually hunting. And we also contributed to Nuclei as part of the project. Uh, we contributed multiple templates uh, and we are keep doing it. 
and it integrates to Arjira using another tool that I will speak about in a few slides, which is called JTrack, something developed by us. And this only an integration layer to Jira, let's say. The next tool is called CXSS. This is another internal tool, which is an, another wrapper for an open source XSS vulnerability scanner called Danfox. This is also something that we run periodically and integrates to our Jira via the same tool, JTrack. Um, the next one is something that we open sourced, and this is a pretty cool tool uh, that I believe that we open sourced. I don't know any other tool that actually does exactly what we do here. What it does is to find dangling uh, domains. Um, it's called DDFR, dangling domains finder. And we all, or most of us, I guess, know what subdomain takeover is, but dangling domains is a much harder issue to detect because let's imagine the case that we have a DNS record that is pointing with an A record to a subdomain and to, sorry, pointing to a, a, an IP address. And this IP address was belonged to an EC2, uh, which was belonged to us, but now we released the EC2 and this is now pointing to an EC2 that doesn't belong to us or to no one, or on another case belongs now to another company and could have some vulnerability. So eventually this is kind of subdomain takeover, but it's much harder to detect uh, because you need to understand if the IP belongs to you or not. In short, what this tool does is to get all your uh, uh, DNS records um, from again, the collector, like I mentioned earlier, and also all the organization known registered cloud IPs, um, and then it creates the correlation. And if there is an IP address pointed from an A record that doesn't belong to us, it will raise a ticket. Okay, so that's about it. Um, another one, and we're almost done with the tools. I know that this is like a lot of tools, is WordPress scanner. I don't have a lot to, to mention on that. Also, it creates uh, Jira tickets automatically, and that's mostly it. The, Last tool that I'm going to talk about is Lictopus. What it does, and by the way, I presented it in B-Sides Tel Aviv two years ago, uh, it can identify code leakage uh, that is belonging to your company. Um, so in case that one of your developers leaked a code on public uh, GitHub, uh, this tool will be able to uh, hopefully identify that and let you know about that. In our case, it's integrated to our SIM. So once we identify a code leakage, uh, it automatically raises a ticket to our SOC uh, that are investigating the case. So next, uh, I'm going to talk about build a responsible disclosure process. This is also important and very important in my opinion. And one of the first thing that you need to do in a company because on a lot of cases, security researchers want to contact you after they found something, maybe even by mistake, but they can't reach out to your company and that's not good. So on a lot of cases, people think that they need to pay money for every responsible disclosure program, but I'm saying that you have two options. You can choose the zero budget option or the paid alternative. What does it mean? On the zero budget, what you can do is to create a free vulnerability disclosure program, uh, like an online page uh, that publishes all the information how to contact your security team. And the second approach, which is even easier, is to create security TXT and humans TXT files in your uh, branding website, like you can see here in our uh, public website. And then it says, how can you contact the security team in case you found something? And also we acknowledge why that hackers that reported uh, security vulnerabilities to us. So again, this is free. Uh, you can just go ahead and do it now. Nothing too fancy, and you can take the example from our website. Regarding pay alternatives, you can have three different options. The first option for a bug bounty program is an internal, and by internal, I mean to your internal employees. This won't work for a company with 20 employees, but we, it will work perfectly to a company like us with 3,000 developers. And that means that if a developer identified a security vulnerability uh, in one of our applications, they will be able to report it and then to get monetary rewards on their report. 
the the best thing about it is that developers in a lot of cases have some internal insights on how things are actually working and they will be able to identify more security vulnerabilities than what you will be able to find from the outside of course there is a policy to that this doesn't mean that i as a developer can create a backdoor and then report on my backdoor so there is a policy around that but eventually it is great. I must say that we had some doubts at the beginning when we started and we started it much way before uh, the private program that we have. Um, and we identified uh, some, I think it was a few uh, critical vulnerabilities, including RCEs um, that affected production. So it was great. Uh, and I deeply recommend that you will do that. Another option is the private or public program like on known platforms like BugCrowd, HackerOne and et cetera. Next, assess and protect your weak spots. So until now, again, we discussed about the low ending fruit and how to outline all the assets that we have. Now we need to be smarter and to understand what are actually the weak spots that we have at our company. So let's take a few examples uh, um, how I can actually focus my program on the right stuff. If I'm developing a SaaS platform with various integrations, then I can almost surely say that I need to be more resilient from SSRF attacks because, again, I have a lot of integrations to the outside. Another example is that as a multi-tenant and multi-roles SaaS platform, I will for sure want to be more resilient against broken authorization uh, vulnerabilities. And in our case, as a gaming company, business logic vulnerabilities are something that we care about more. And I will give you just one example. Imagine that you have a slot machine and you can spin the slot machine once. I want to make sure that you can spin it more than once and get this twice as rewards. Okay, so everyone with their own weak spots and their own risks. And you know your company the best again, and I said it before and I will say it, say it again. Another thing is to track your security tickets in one place. So. Eventually, you ended up with all those uh, checks that you have in the way, and you have a lot of security tickets, but you want to track it in one place so you will be able to prioritize it correctly and to get more statistics on what you are doing. Um, so how can you do that? As I mentioned earlier, we have a tool that uh, I actually developed called JTrack. What it does is just anything to Jira integration eventually. So it doesn't matter where uh, what is your scan or what do you want to open in your Jira? But eventually you can connect anything to Jira uh, with a simple uh, CLI command. It's available on GitHub. And eventually the secret sauce about it is that it is managing and tracking the ticket's state. And this is the out part. So I won't open the same ticket over and over again. So it just manages the state of the ticket. So this is part of the remediation phase. Now let's take a look at the old picture for a sec. We call all the stuff that I just mentioned continuous recon. And it starts with the collector that gets all the domain names. And then we are getting only the external domain names. And we are scanning it with various tools like Enant, CXSS, DDFR, and WP scan. Then we open Jira tickets uh, if we found something. And you might think that we are not actually using an external attack surface management tool, but you are wrong because we do. Uh, and we are enriching both sides. So the EASM product that we have enriches the domain list that we have. And also the collector also enriches the EASM product that we are using. So there are some advantages of still using such a product. Um, so we are using both. Okay, but wait, what about retest? So we found so many bugs along the way, but let's imagine that I have identified a misconfiguration vulnerability and that one of my Nginx servers exposed something publicly that it shouldn't have. How do I know that a day after it was fixed by the DevOps and the Jira ticket was closed that it's not actually opened again? So this is why we ended up with the concept of regression tests on security. So the purpose is to have a feedback loop of automated regression tests. And once uh, a regression has been introduced, we will automatically open Jira ticket and make sure to fix it again. 
What was the motivation for that? First of all, developers now have a clear acceptance criteria of what they need to do. So they don't need to guess what should be the fix because eventually once we've identified a security vulnerability, we automatically create a, a nuclei template in our case uh, with the check to identify the vulnerability. At first, it of course fails because we still haven't fixed the issue. And then the developers know what to do in order to fix it and it reduces the manual retest efforts that we need to put from our penetration testers because, again, this is now done manually, eh, automatically. So you might ask yourself, do you automate everything? And the answer is no, we don't automate everything. What we automate and the two main rules that we have for what is aimed for automation is, first of all, is it easy to automate? And the second, is there high chances of regressions? Um, for example, things that we do automate is like I mentioned before, the Nginx and in general, unintentionally publicly exposed endpoints or data. This is a great example of what we do automate. How does it look? Uh, so in short, we have a single code repository uh, of custom nuclei templates that we build. And once a developer fixes or an operation person fixes a vulnerability, uh, the regression tests uh, are keep running once a day. And when we identify a regression, we open the JIRA ticket once again for the team to fix it. This is how it eventually looks like, uh, just a simple YAML template. And since it, it is so simple to create YAML templates, we do give security champions also the option to contribute, pull request and to contribute some of the regression tests. So it's not all on the penetration testers to do. Um, as I said, it is being executed once a day. So now, after we are done with all the right side, let's start shifting to the left side. So we wanted to shift left. And as Bar said in his presentation, we can't go back to waterfall on one case, but this is not something easy to actually become agile as R&D teams, but we wanted to do that. And this is why we asked ourselves and created a few constraints on what needs to be done in order for us to actually be able to shift left. Um, so the first thing and the first constraint that we have is, or the first question, how do we, how and when should we know about new features? Um, how can we identify risky changes in real time? How can we shift left and test features as early as possible and this is an important one while keeping the business running at the same velocity as before because we don't want to stop the business and again bring back waterfall it wasn't that successful and times has changed um eventually traditional penetration testing is not something cost effective and on a lot of cases a day after the penetration test was done uh, the developers will release a critical vulnerability to production so not only a critical feature, but also a critical vulnerability, and we want to stay ahead and know about it. Another question is, how can we cover a wider attack surface with the same means? Eventually, I can't go to my boss and say, okay, I need to double the amount of people that I have in my team or to double my budget. It won't happen. So I need to work with the same means. So what did we do to make it happen? First of all, we created all the software architects that we have at the company as security architects by design. So we had meetings with them and training sessions to make them more aware about security. Uh, we worked really close with them on all that. Um, they are also now creating and doing threat modeling as part of the high level designs that they are preparing. Uh, and in case that they need to have a second opinion, if they are working on a risky feature, then they can contact us. We will go over the HLD that they are doing the level design and we will give our feedback uh, for how can it be improved. We also have steering committees with various business uh, units. That means that we are meeting each and every one of the business units once every six weeks to go over all the open vulnerabilities that we have to see on which new features they are working on and to give our feedback and to be involved in those places. 
Another cool thing that we did is to work close with QA teams. So QA teams are like siblings of AppSec eventually. So, so we wanted to integrate ourselves into their uh, process. And usually what QA team does is to create user stories. What a user story or scenarios to test user stories. Eventually what it means that if I need to spin or as a user, I want to spin a slot machine once and get a reward. So we are creating also, and QA teams are now creating abuser stories. So as an abuser, I, I'd like to spin the slot machine twice and get as twice as re, uh, rewards. And eventually what it makes them is to think more about security earlier in the process and identify business logic issues that are very hard to find with dust or other means. So that was something really effective that we did. But again, this is mostly about talking and manual process. So we wanted to have something more automated and to make it even more wide, let's say. So what was the motivation? I guess that it's pretty um, something that we can all understand. Eventually, what we decided is that we want to focus on risks and not only on vulnerabilities. And we wanted to identify the risks earlier uh, in the SDLC. And we made it under the assumption that risks often lead to actual vulnerabilities. And again, as Bar said, vulnerabilities is something that we have a lot of, and there is alert fatigue eventually, especially from tools like Dust, Sust, and all that, those. So we want to have vulnerabilities with context. So we don't want to look at a Sust uh, finding by itself, but only on a Sust finding if it is deployed to production and uh, is actually running. Just one example. Also to continuously look for risky changes. And we're going to talk about what is a risky change in a sec. And eventually we wanted to fuel our penetration testers with precise and impactful challenges. So they won't need to retest the same application over and over again each time that we are releasing something because it's not feasible. We are releasing new features to production multiple times a day eventually. And by the way, challenge is how we call a mini penetration test in our case. It could be a penetration test on a new API endpoint, on a complete back office application, or on a specific feature. So how did we do that? Uh, how did we start? So first of all, we did some brainstorming and we understood and we said that everything is possible. Let's start to think uh, what do we want to actually find and what is a material change? And we also did some retrospective on known vulnerabilities that we had uh, in the past to identify the uh, material changes. And once we found the uh, common ground, we went back to reality and looked at the commonness of the vulnerabilities that we identified. What was the impact? Because we don't want to focus our efforts on something which doesn't have a lot of impact. And how difficult will it be to actually implement it using an automation? And we ended up with something like that, uh, with a table. Um, so let's take a few examples. So we had the material change on one column and the priority and effort. For example, one material change is internal API that is now exposed publicly. The priority of this one is high because it could lead to high impact uh, issue. And the effort is medium because this is not that hard to automate. Another example is a change in content security policy. The priority is medium because eventually this is a, an hardening layer and not a vulnerability by itself, but the effort to implement that is low. So we might want to also do that. You have a few more examples here, but I'm gonna skip that. So let's take uh, the first uh, real example that we actually implemented. And I'm going to present it in the way of given when then. Uh, this is like a good way that QA teams usually do uh, to describe a, a QA scenarios. Uh, given a PR, a pull request is opened, and when a new API route is introduced or modified, and when the route is processing the user input, when the user input property name is prone for unintended behavior, for example, URL to SSRF, and redirect URL to open redirect. I, I'm gonna explain what it means because it might not be that understood. So let's imagine that I'm adding a new API and this API has a new attribute, or it could be a, a query param or in the body, another param that is called URL. 
eventually, what we know from our experience as security professionals is that in a lot of cases, a parameter name called URL could lead to SSRF vulnerability. Redirect URL often leads to a vulnerability of open redirect. So what we want to do in this case is to place a comment in the pull request to tell the developer, to give them kind of an insight, to tell them, are you know what you're doing? Did you make all the uh, input validation that you need to do? And uh, so just to raise the awareness and then also to require a security review and uh, to create a challenge to our penetration testers to actually check that we don't have any actual vulnerability in that. This is how eventually it looks uh, in GitHub to the developers. Uh, this is their developer experience. In this case, we are saying a product security uh, GitHub app found a potential risk. Note that we are talking about a potential risk and not about a vulnerability in this case. Um, the parameter name CMD is commonly associated with RC vulnerabilities, and we are giving them some links to read more about that. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. Actually, this is uh, not the updated presentation, Leo. So <laughs> next time. Um, <laughs> the second example is risk-based approach. Um, of risk-based approach is given a PR is opened and when a content security policy is changed, then we want to create a challenge for the team. Um, another last one, which is I think more interesting about subdomain takeovers is given a, given a PR is opened when a URL is present and when the URL is a takeable subdomain, then block the PR with a relevant comment. So we took something that usually companies do with their external text surface management tool, and we shifted it to the most right side to the pull request phase. And this is how eventually this, is lo this looks in uh, the eyes of a developer. We are saying that the following URLs were found in code and are pointing to a non-existing S3 bucket. So that will make the developer actually have the S3 bucket before pointing to that from their code. Um, in, in general, our vision for this approach will be to detect more material changes from more sources other than SCM. Um, you can take some examples from API Gateway, for example, if this now exposes something or from cloud accounts that we have. Um, another thing is that we would like to analyze documentation, and this is even going lefter in the SDLC. Uh, to review high-level design and then to give feedback to the architects or to the product teams uh, with some risky changes that they are introducing and even more AI usage. So I'm not sure that I mentioned it, but the example uh, that I showed with the parameters, the risky parameters, this is done by or with the help of AI because eventually trying to extract all the list of endpoints from code and the parameters is something that is easy to do manually, and there is no tool out there that can actually do it automatically. So we used AI for that, and that worked like a magic. Just to wrap up, um, so we said that you probably want to create your own risky changes rules. Um, eventually, what I presented here is things that was common to Platica um, and things that we wanted to focus at. And we are planning to release an open source framework uh, to create or to allow other people to create more rules. Shift left, but only when you are ready. Don't always start from shifting left. It is harder to maintain, and you won't always find all the vulnerabilities that you plan to use uh, at the beginning. Use open source tools to map and attack your external attack surface. Eventually, we have great open source tools that you can use. Um, make sure that you have a full vulnerability management lifecycle, especially around retests, and that you know where you are tracking your tickets. On a lot of companies that I have to, uh, they add tickets, uh, developers close the tickets, but no one actually tested the tickets that it was actually closed. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out here and ask it. And by the way, you can read more about all the things that I presented here uh, really quickly on our Platycan blog. Thank you. Wow, what a presentation, Otem. Yeah, it was long, I know, and I squeezed a lot of uh, things inside, so. I, I, I'm seeing it as a, as a technical person. I can tell you that 
it's it's reflect a very high uh, application security program. So all can learn from Autumn experience, and I truly believe that he's you know he's he's putting his experience in the presentation. And um, if you will go through all his steps, you know it, you will receive you will receive a high level of uh, application security. Uh, of course, as uh, Rotem said, uh, you need to um, adapt it to your um, to your pipeline, to your development process, uh, to your company business. So you know uh, Rotem presented uh, Platica and how they did it. However, you need to take. Uh, and adapt it to your uh, your company, your development lifecycle. So, Autumn, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have we have just one one uh, one uh, uh, minute to answer questions. So, I will try to um, to shift the uh, view the all the the questions in order to keep up time. Um, ask your questions in the Q and A. If we won't have time now, we will stay in the end of the meetup and answer all your questions. So. Feel free, it's in the Q&A. I do want to mention something that is relevant to a question here in the Q&A. Um, most of the tools that Rotem presented are open source. So you don't need to have a huge budget in order to implement open source. It's free. You can download it. And also, Rotem, you're also publishing open source uh, uh, projects that people can download. Yeah. Okay, so that's very important. You don't need, you don't need to buy a very expensive solution, um, or start with with an open source and then continue uh, to to some license. Okay, so in order to keep up time, um, we'll go to the to the next presentation. Um, Autumn, if you want, you can answer uh, in the Q and A also uh, digitally. So thank you very much, Autumn, for your presentation. Very insightful. Um, I also learn, you know, I'm, I'm taking notes and also taking it into consideration in my company. So very interesting. 